Today is Sunday, November 1st, and we had some technical difficulties with the recording for the sermon this morning, so this is a re-recording for the virtual service. The day's passage is from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Habakkuk 1, 1 through 5. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous, for the justice is perverted. Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. We live in an amazing world. Impossible things are happening. Really. Can you catch sunlight in your hand? Yes. Yes, you can. In 2013, Scientists with the American Physics Society managed to catch a beam of light in a crystal and hold it there for about a minute. Since light moves at about 200,000 miles per second, that light bounced around the crystal enough times that it could have gone to the moon and back 20 times. Can you stop time? Sort of. Scientists have recently found a way to send a message that is partially hidden from time itself. Now, this isn't about moving a physical thing, but they found a way to transfer data in a way that about 50% of the data is hidden from time. Okay, but we still have to obey the laws of physics, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You can't make a perpetual motion machine. Agreed? <laughs> Who knows anymore? Scientists from NASA recently submitted for peer review a paper on the EM drive. This is an engine that creates thrust without a chemical reaction and without consuming any fuel. They even built a prototype, and to everyone's surprise, it worked. Now, the thrust it created was minimal, and even the scientists who built it are not 100% sure how it worked. But it worked. Now, the problem here is that this breaks all of physics. And yet it works. These are amazing and impossible things. But they're also mostly theoretical. We don't know if they'll ever have any practical application in life. Today, I want to talk about a God who does impossible things in our lives. And I'm not talking about miracles here. I'm not talking about feeding thousands of people with a little bit of food or raising the dead or anything like that. Our God can and does do those things. But many of the greatest miracles God performs throughout history and throughout the Bible are things that don't violate the laws of physics and are anything like the miracles the unbelieving world looks for. Rather, our God is at work in people's lives. Our God has fed thousands of people with just a little bit of food. But he has given billions of people the water of life when they were thirsty for him. Our God has raised the dead. But more than that, he has brought new life to people whose lives were destroyed by addiction or betrayal or loss. Our God is at work in this world. And nowhere is that more evident than in the book of Habakkuk. Now, for the last couple months, we have been in the book of Philippians. And today I'm going to go back to our earlier series, Minor Prophets, Major Impact. And we're going to begin with the book of Habakkuk. And first off, i got to say, Habakkuk 
is my favorite name in the Bible. Habakkuk is just a fun word to say. But more than that, Habakkuk was a man who knew what it was like to see his life crumble around him. Habakkuk lived in the mid-7th century. And maybe you've heard the old Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. Well, Habakkuk lived in interesting times. The war in Israel, the civil war, was long over. The nation had been permanently divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. But there had been a shift in the world. For generations, God had been calling the people back to him. And the people had refused to turn to the Lord. And finally, God was rising up against the Israelites. Now, in the southern kingdom of Judah, things were okay. Josiah the reformer had led the people back to the Lord. But Josiah was dead, and the people were starting to fall back into bad habits. But the real problem was in the northern kingdom of Israel. There, the people had turned their back on God for generations, for hundreds of years, and God had had enough. He raised up the Assyrian Empire to attack and invade Israel. Israel was defeated, the nation was destroyed, the cities were turned into rubble, and the people were sent into exile. And for a while, there was no nation of Israel. And this invasion was the inciting incident and the most important focus for Habakkuk's book. And Habakkuk began his book with some words that really speak to me. After a short introduction, Habakkuk cried out to God, How long, O Lord? <coughs> I've been there. I've been in that spot where I say, How long, O Lord? I have had that happen a few times in my life, but right now I don't think I can help but talk about this pandemic. Because in this midst of this pandemic, we say, how long, O oh Lord? How long will this go on? Now, back in March, the state of Indiana went into a kind of lockdown. And during that time, I started putting out a three to five minute video every day to encourage people and to provide guidance for spiritual growth in the midst of social distancing. And when I started making those videos, I wondered, I really, genuinely thought this. Will I make 21 of these videos? I wondered if this pandemic would last a whole three weeks. We're now hitting the eight-month mark. And I think we're starting to become virus-weary. This has gone on for so long that it just weighs us down. Now, I recognize that we have been very blessed in this area. Very few people in our congregation have come down with this disease. Those who have had confirmed cases have all recovered. And just speaking for myself, I personally have not known anyone who has died from this disease. But we have faced the social effects of this. We have been isolated. We have been separated from those we care about. We have been restricted in what we can do. And that's not going to end anytime soon. Just this past week, America's leading expert on infectious disease, Dr. Anthony Fauci, said that even if there is a vaccine, these restrictions will continue throughout 2021. And so we say, how long? How long, oh Lord, is this going to last? <coughs> now, that is not the only time in my life I have said that. It's not the only time that phrase occurs in the Bible. Over the first verse of the 13th Psalm, David cried out, How long, O Lord? How long will you hide your face from me? David was writing about a time of spiritual dryness in his life. God seemed far away. He prayed, and he meditated, and he fasted. He struggled in his spirit. He wrestled with his soul. And yet God was not present. The God who had been 
with him throughout his life seemed gone. The Lord that he had a personal relationship with seemed absent. It had been absent for a long time. And he cried out, How long, O oh Lord? To give a modern example of this, Mother Teresa was a Roman Catholic nun who devoted her life to helping the poor in Calcutta, India. And in 1979, Mother Teresa was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and her work has inspired millions of people. And near the end of her life, Mother Teresa gave an interview in which she said that for the past 15 years, she had not felt the presence of God. When she was younger, she felt God call her into service, and she felt the presence of Christ throughout her life. But then for a decade and a half, she said that it seemed as if the door had been closed to her. And she wondered how long. And I think a lot of us have experienced that in life. It's such a common thing, there's even a name for it. It's called the long, dark night of the soul. It's that time in life when we feel as if God is distant and stay distant for a very long time. And we cry out, how long, O Lord? How long will I feel dry? How long will I feel passionless, empty, like I'm just going through the motions? How long, O Lord? Or we can look to the original context in which Habakkuk said, how long, O Lord? Habakkuk was talking about the wickedness of this world. I said, how long, O Lord, will you let evil win? Literally, Habakkuk said, why do you make me see inequity? Inequity means to be unfair or unequal. It means to treat one group of people one way and another group of people another way. Specifically, Habakkuk said that those with power use force and violence to get what they want. And Habakkuk said that as long as force rules, as long as might makes right, then justice will never prevail. Habakkuk said, how long? How long will you keep letting evil win? He said, God, you are good. You are just. You are holy. You are righteous. Why do you keep letting immorality prevail? The big event for Habakkuk was the Assyrian invasion. Assyria had destroyed Habakkuk's homeland, and Habakkuk cried out to God and said, Why have you let this happen? How long will you let evil men keep on winning? Now, as I said earlier in this sermon, the Israelites had turned away from God. And Habakkuk does not pretend that the Israelites were such good people that they deserved God's protection. Rather, Habakkuk said that, yes, the Israelites were bad. They were corrupt. But the Assyrians were so much worse. Why did God let them win? And so Habakkuk said, how long? How long will this go on? How long will there be inequity and injustice? And I think that phrase, how long, sums up so much of our lives. <coughs> how long? Long will evil win? How long will I feel dry and empty? How long will suffering continue? Habakkuk cried out to God, how long? And then God answered. Well, sort of. God did not answer the question Habakkuk asked. Habakkuk asked, how long will this go on? And God did not give Habakkuk a time frame. God did something better. He said, God said, watch and see and be amazed. Because I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if I told you. Now, for Habakkuk, this meant that God would not allow the Assyrians to go unpunished. Not long after Habakkuk wrote his book, God raised up the Babylonian army. They marched to the capital of Assyria, they conquered the nation, they destroyed the empire. And after this Babylonian victory, there would never again be a nation of Assyria. But 
this is about more than just bringing justice against the Assyrians. This is also about God's redemptive plan. Because God raised up the Babylonians to destroy Assyria, but he also then used the Babylonians to purify the Israelites. He used the Babylonians to refine the Israelites, to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would save us from our sins. Or, when we cry out to God, how long will you be distant? As David did, he cried, how long will you hide your face? And God says to us, watch and be amazed. I'm going to do something in your life that you would not believe, even if I told you. Many people have gone through a time of dryness, when God seemed distant. And yet, God often used those people for even greater things. It seems that we need to go through that long, dark night of the soul before we can experience God's presence and power in our lives. We see this throughout the Bible. King David, the man after God's own heart, was the one who first cried out, How long will you hide your face from me? Moses, the leader of Israel, had to spend 40 years in exile before God appeared to him in a burning bush. Isaiah, the greatest prophet in Israel's history, once felt so spiritually die, dry that he said it would be better for him to die than to live. Even our Lord Jesus Christ began his ministry with 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. Too often, when we feel spiritually dry, we view it as a punishment from God. But more often, it is God preparing us for even greater things in his service. C.S. Lewis once said, that when a man looks at the world around him and sees no sign of God and feels nothing of God's presence, and still chooses to serve, that is when the devil is most defeated in his life. Or, we can look at the suffering of this world. We can look at this pandemic and we can say, how long, God, how long will this go on? How long will there be suffering and pain? How many people will have to die? How long will this last? And God turns to us and he says, watch and be amazed. Because I will do something through this that you would not believe, even if you were told. I'd like to tell you a very personal story about this. Many of you may remember, several years ago, about nine years ago, me and I were in the process of adopting. And we had been going through this process for a while, and it was July, and we decided to take a vacation. So we drove nine hours to Virginia, and we got there, and then we got a call that we'd been matched with a birth mother. So we immediately drove nine hours back to Indiana. And we were prepared to adopt. We talked with the birth mother. We were ready to go. We heard that the baby was being born, so we went to the hospital. And we were sitting in the waiting room of the hospital, waiting to go up to meet the baby, and the social worker came down and told us that the birth mother had changed her mind. And we were not able to adopt. It was one of the most painful days of our lives. As we drove away, we said, why God? Why is this letting this happen? How long will this kind of thing go on for us? And we didn't know it at the time, but the following August, Paley was born. And if that first adoption had gone through, then we would have left the program and we would never have met Paley. And I cannot think of a worse tragedy. Now, I didn't know what was going on at the time. I had no revelation from God. But I could imagine God saying to us, as we cried out, how long? And God says to us, watch and be amazed. Because I'm going to do something in your life that you would not believe 
if I told you in advance. And still today, God says to us, watch and be amazed. Because our God is at work. As we deal with this pandemic, and we say, how long? God says, watch and be amazed. Now, I don't know what's God, what God's going to do. I have no prophetic vision here. I don't know the future. But I have faith. I trust in our God. In the God who takes what has gone bad and turns it for what is good. He takes what is intended for evil and he uses it for his glory. I have faith that God is at work. That our God is always at work for the good of those who love him. I don't know how God's going to use this event. I don't know what is coming. But I tr put my trust in the God who says, watch and be amazed. Because I'm going to do something through this that you would not believe, even if I told you. Because our God is always at work. And ultimately, this is a call to faith. It's a call to trust the God who is at work in our lives. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know how God could use even this pandemic. But God calls us to faith in him. To trust that he is at work. That he is the one who says, watch and be amazed. Because I'm going to do something that you would not believe, even if you were told. Our God does amazing things. He calls us to faith in him.